This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Is the God of the Old Testament different than the God of the New Testament? We'll discuss that today with Bible Discovery TV's Rod Hembry. But first, how do we respond to a growing issue in our culture that nothing is anyone's fault anymore and everyone plays the victim card? I asked this question to author and speaker Sean McDowell. A big uh, kind of a paradigm shift coming with, within this generation or maybe just this time of history is that we're kind of shifting to a, 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 what you'd call a culture from a culture of dignity to a culture of victimhood. All of a sudden everybody's a victim. You, you know, you've hurt my feelings. I don't like what you said about me. I'm hurt. And everybody wants to be a victim now. What, what's causing the shift in your mind? Well, in some ways, this is brought on because we've actually seen a lot of abuses of power that have come to light in this generation, and that there's many people who have been victimized who have never had a voice to speak up before. They've been shamed. They've been silenced. We've seen this with the Me Too movement. So a lot of the victimhood is just a legitimate recognition that there have been people in power in all sorts of different uh, whether it's in the media, whether it's in the church, whether it's an educational system, police officers, yeah. whatever, yeah. and there's victims. But on the flip side, it's gone even further than that, where it used to be we had a dignity culture that people had value just because they are human beings. Now, you almost have more value and clout and right to speak based upon the greater number of areas in which you are victim in your life. And so we're raising up this victimhood status that in some ways I think is problematic and troubling. I mean, there's this Jesse Smollett case, mm -hmm. a black gay actor from Empire. And according to the reports, it's still being played out, staged this attack by a white person yeah. wearing, a, wearing a, a Make America Great hat again. In other words, to make more money, if he could portray himself as a greater victim, that would raise his status. And I just think that's a problematic way to look at the world through this lens of victimhood doesn't empower people to realize, yes, there has been genuine victimhood that is taking place, but there can be healing and there can be empowering and we can move from beyond this. It seems that uh, the media is so quick to take up the cause of a victim. I mean, the Jesse Smollett case, I mean, they, they took up the case, they believed his story in spite of how ludicrous some of it was. I mean, out on the Chicago streets at 40 below zero, things like that. Right. Why, why do we, we, we tend to accept those, those, those so quickly? Well, I think a couple things going on. All of us have a viewpoint and a worldview about life. So when we see stories that reinforce our worldview, we're more likely to believe them and reject others. I've seen stories that I've retweeted and had to pull back and go, ah, shoot. Turns out that story, that wasn't all the full details. So now I'm very careful as best I can to not advance stories that aren't true. Well, why would the media jump upon this when they are supposed to be those who report and ask right. tough questions? And yet they just uncritically jump on the story with all these ridiculous factors. That's because they hold a certain worldview and they're looking for stories to advance it. They want to paint certain people, in many cases, Trump voters and white people as the oppressors and everybody else as those who are oppressed. Well, the problem is, is when there's hoaxes that are there, we miss it. And it doesn't ultimately lead to advancing truth, which we're seeing come out in this case. And, and I've, I've seen several cases where, uh, especially young white uh, teenagers, college students, high schoolers, really want to go to the side of the victim because they don't want to appear to be part of the perpetrator. They don't want to be part of the oppressor. So I don't know whether it's a, uh, uh, a sympathy for the victim, but at the same time, they don't want to appear to be the oppressor. How do we get our kids to, to look at these things uh, rationally? Well, I think we have to point out the worldview behind it. We have to point out some of the nonsense that's there, mm -hmm. but we also have to point out some of the legitimate victimhood that has taken place. So I've shared this Jesse Smollett case with my kids and I just asked them, I said, hey, why do you think a person who's a black gay man and actor with power and money would seemingly fake this incident? What does this tell us about our culture? What does this tell us about the media? And just try to unpack it with young people so they'll see it in a way they might not if they're just watching the news alone. Yeah. 
if, if you really are a victim, I mean, you'd mentioned the, the Me Too movement and, and a lot of these people really are victims and they just didn't have a voice before. And if you're truly a victim, how do you, how do you free yourself from being the perpetual victim of a perpetrator? Uh, well, there, with, there's different a, levels of talking about this. Pardon? One is just physically getting away from that person, closing down communication. I mean, if you are really being victimized by somebody, you have to share that with somebody else and you have to get people around you to help you and have healthy boundaries to stop that victimization, whatever it is, whether it's emotional or physical or some other fashion. But there also comes a point in life where my father had an alcoholic father, my grandfather, his entire life, basically. My dad's older sister committed suicide and my father was sexually abused for seven years. And one of the things he'd say to me is, I asked him, I'm like, dad, how do you not see yourself just as a a victim and he looked at me and goes son i just don't see myself as used goods he goes i'm not a victim i'm not going to see my life through this victimhood status because that takes away my power to have healthy relationships and to influence the world so i think we have to share with this generation stories of people who've been genuinely hurt and the pain that comes with that but ways through prayer through relationships through counseling through the body of Christ, they've been able to cope with this and experience healing. These are the kinds of stories this generation needs to hear. How important is, is forgiveness to that victim? I mean, even if they're separated, from, I mean, in your, your dad's case, if you're separated from the perpetrator by uh, several years or even by miles, maybe that, that perpetrator is miles away and you can't contact them, they may even be dead. How do they free themselves up? Does, does forgiveness free them in that case, even if the perpetrator isn't there to accept it or there to acknowledge it? Well, forgiveness is something you can always offer, but you have no control if the person is going to accept it or not. So somebody's healing is not always dependent upon the person who victimized them saying, you're right, I did wrong, I'm sorry. Sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. But what we have to come to the point with is in our own hearts, a willingness to forgive and a choice to forgive. Believe it or not, is freeing. It's enslaving to hold on to hate. It's yeah. enslaving to not forgive somebody else. So I actually think a lot of what we hear about in this kind of critical theory today, and I'm not against, well, social justice becomes this political kind of terminology, a way people talk about reaching the poor and the marginalized. And what I see in that world is there's not talk about grace. There's not talk about forgiveness. You're to blame just because you're a certain race, because you're certain economic, and there's status, and there's no way out of this. Well, in Christianity, there's grace. In Christianity, there's forgiveness. That's where healing really takes place. Sean, thank you again. Really appreciate you being with us. And again, where can they grab the book the next, so the next generation will know? One of two places. You go to my website seanmcdowell.org and we have links to the book there or of course just go to amazon.com and they'll send you one as soon as they can or of course you can get it on kindle sean thank you very much for being here really appreciate it thanks bob enjoyed it a lot the bible is 66 books divided into two historic sections the old and the new testament a common observation by some is that there seems to be a significant difference in the god of both sections Ron Hembry hosts Bible Discovery TV, and he's been teaching the Bible verse by verse for most of his adult life. So I ask him that question, is the whole Bible representing the same God? You've been involved in, in going through the Bible every year, teaching the Bible, and we want to talk about some of that today because there's nothing more controversial or, or well-read than, than this book. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, it, the 733,000 plus words in the Bible. Yeah. Got it. And constantly we get, we get people saying, the God of the Old Testament He's too harsh for me. I'll take Jesus any day. I'll go to the New Testament. Same God. Same God, different times. A lot of people mm -hmm. think that, um, that there's a different God in the Old Testament. Yeah. You know, like, let's throw him out because I don't like him. You know, he talks about judgment and killing people and all of this. He's a different God. But that's reading into the Bible what we think. It's amazing how many people think mm -hmm. that this is what God would do, so therefore that God is not my yeah. God. God does things himself. And we need to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ is part of God, the Father, Son, mm -hmm. and the Holy Spirit, one God and three persons. Right. So God does the same things. We can't project onto God what we think, mm -hmm. we think he should do. 
Now, having said that, I find the God of the Old Testament to be incredibly merciful and unbelievably graceful. Uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely stunning. You know, when you look at everything that's happened, God deals with Adam and Eve in Genesis. I don't believe that's an allegory. I believe mm -hmm. that's true. true. So God deals with Adam and Eve in a very profound way. He does not smash everything, you know, mm -hmm. right there. But he comes in and he says, what have you done? Who told you you were naked? Have you sinned? He begins to question mm -hmm. them. Because he understands, God knows that they sin. I mean, I find sure. it fascinating yeah. that Adam and Eve try to hide behind a bush when God <laughs> sin. I mean, God can see I everything. I created the bush. Yeah. <laughs> so um, what God does is he tries to bring out from them confession. Confession. Tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. And then, of course, when Adam and Eve are there and Adam says, well, you know, it's the woman you gave me. Yeah. And Eve says, yeah, well, it's Satan, yeah. you know. And we pass the blame, pass, pass the off. blame. That's human sure. nature. And so God tells us and he speaks to us many ways that, that he is going to be merciful with us, mm -hmm. but there is a cost for our sin, S-I-N, a real word, a real thing mm -hmm. that emanates from Satan right. that is in us and we have to deal with that sin. Now, That's we, important. Yeah. And, and, and we've heard it said that the, the Bible is really a reflection of the culture at the times. It is. And it's, it's uh, the, the sin of the people, things like that. Let's, let's go to 1 Samuel. I, want, I, I love this scripture because it's one of those things that uh, I've read over and over. And in this, God specifically gives Saul a mission. This was the mission he gave him, was to go in and destroy the Amalekites, including women and nursing babies, mm -hmm. which sounds absolutely horrid. Uh, and, if you and it, isolate just that passage, yeah. If you take that and, and you look at you look at 15 and where it ends up, where, where Samuel's saying God delights not in the sacrifice but in obedience, mm -hmm. and this is the point we're getting to. Yeah, of course, people are incensed by that because they say, "Well, wait a minute, God's commanding babies and children yeah. to be mm -hmm. slaughtered along with the mothers." I mean, how dare God do that? They don't understand that the Amalekites, the background and all of the other nations, mm -hmm. the Moabites, what's, what's the background? So when you begin to read the whole right. Bible. What is God doing with them? At the exactly, same time, right? what is God doing with them? And what is God trying to say to us? This is so important. Mm -hmm. Now remember that the Bible commits itself to truth, so it is truth. Absolutely. So it's gotta tell the truth about right. human nature. So it, it, it tells the truth about the Amalekites. It tells the truth about the people who come into the land of Israel after Abraham comes in and they take it over and they do what they want right. to do when God has already given the land mm -hmm. to Abraham. Mm -hmm. That's uh, com completely yeah. uh, illustrated in the, in the Word of God. And of course, we know that today because we have Israel today. But the idea is that God says, I'm going to speak a sentence, not mm -hmm. a word. We like to isolate things to a specific word. Sure. But we've got to listen to what God is saying through all of time. You've got to look at the background of that. And you've got to look at unrepentant Amalekites and what God is doing in, in, in their world. Of course. But my, my, favorite, my favorite scripture there is where Saul says, and, and, and Saul has said, I, I, I did what God told me to do. I did it. And Samuel says, what is this bleeding of sheep that I hear in my ear and this, and this lowing of cattle? And he's, well, I, I did that so I could make a sacrifice to God. And God knows the truth in Saul's heart. Of course he does. He knows the truth. And, and Saul's saying things that aren't true. Yeah. I did that because I'm trying to help the Lord. No, you're not, Saul. Yeah. God is telling the truth. He's saying the truth about human nature because he was commanded. He said, you know, Samuel said, wait till I come and I will do the sacrifice. See, that's what Samuel yeah. said. So Samuel told that to Saul, and Saul says, well, we're waiting, we're waiting, and he didn't come, he didn't come, he didn't come. So, But Samuel, whatever reason, whatever reason, he was delayed. Maybe it was on purpose. And this is what Saul did. So Saul couldn't wait because the, he had to get things ready because the men were doing things, and we've got to get ready. That's the problem. Today, we have to get ready. We have to get on Facebook. We have to do this. We have to do that. We have, we have to do this. God has to know I have to do this. Yeah. God not only knows, but he also knows you don't have to do that. So that's the thing we need to understand is God is speaking to us through these stories so that we can hear ourselves in Saul. And here, we yeah. can hear ourselves. Making here. the excuses. Making excuses. Right. We need to listen to what the Lord said right. because that's important. So as you, take, as you take the Old Testament, whether it's the dietary laws, or we see the slavery, we see people selling their daughters into slavery, things like that, we don't find any of that in the New Testament. But that's not God doing it, it's God re reporting it 
reporting on it. God, again, the Bible commits itself to truth. Mm -hmm. The truth about human nature, the, actually the Bible should be rated R in some places, especially in the book of Judges, you know, mm -hmm. where you've got people, but it tells the truth about what people did and why they did it and how they did it and all that. And God is a merciful God. And he comes to us in Psalms, we read all about the graciousness, the mercy, mm -hmm. the amazing things of God. Well, and we, we have that mercy and that grace, and we see it in the New Testament. We mm -hmm. see it throughout the Old Testament, if you're, if, you're, if you're looking into it. You see that, but people will use that as, a, as an excuse today for their sin, saying, well, you're still eating shellfish. You know, you're, you're sinning too. Well, I can do this. I can, I can have this lifestyle. And they use that as an excuse for their sin. Time changes, and in the middle of time, Jesus Christ came, who was fully God and fully man. He changed the way we see things. Right. So now when, G, when God sees me, he does not see me, he sees Jesus Christ works in me. Jesus Christ rose from the dead after the third day in the flesh. He changed everything. So the time changed, but God did not change. God is the same, but the times change. So you can't compare the times. You know, you can't do that. It just doesn't work. You compare know? to data. You can't yeah. do that. Yeah. I mean, you've got to understand that the time we live in is a time of right. grace and we need to understand that there's an end to that time mm -hmm. and Jesus Christ will come back as we read in Revelation chapter 19 and he will come back and he will correct people and uh, you know that's the and way it is. Yeah, and there's other things coming. Yeah. We're going to talk, talk about that. We're going to take a break right now. We'll be right back. Now in our second season, Viewpoint is hitting more topics head on than ever this year. Every Viewpoint program is produced without any commercial advertising, but we couldn't do this show without the support of our financial partners, and it only takes a minute to give. Go to WTLW.com and click Get Involved, then Donate. Your gift of $20, $50, or even $100 will help continue the outreach of TV44's Viewpoint program to impact your hometown and the world. I'm back with the host of Bible Discovery TV, Rod Hembry. Glad to have you here. It Good to be so here. It's so exciting just to get into it and, and, and talk about it. But as we, as we went to break, we were talking, you were talking about Christ and leading all the way into, into Revelation. And people will look at, at the New Testament, they look at Jesus, and they, see, they say, yeah, I, I, anybody can love that man. You know, he's self-sacrificing. He's, he's, he's as gentle as a lamb. And then you look at God the Father back in the Old Testament, and people saying, uh, who is this old man up in the sky with a long beard or something? And, and where's the Holy Spirit and all this? It's one Godhead. It's, it's, it's it is one Godhead. See, you're, you're, you're three. I'm three. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? Yeah. I'm the spirit, I'm the soul, I'm the body. My right. body is still under sin. And when I get up in the morning and look at myself in the mirror, I go, oh my goodness, <laughs> sin is really doing its number on me. I, I tell you. <laughs> That's right. We're but, body, soul, um, and spirit. But my spirit, uh, saved by Christ, and soul follows that. And when we look at that and we understand it, we, we realize that the Trinity is nothing more than God in his three right. forms. And we need to understand it's one God. We worship one mm -hmm. God. But he has expressed himself in three ways, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that's really important. Now, they're in also the first verse of Genesis. There is a word, the beginning letter and the end letter, and it's, it's after God. God created the heavens and the earth. It's after God, but it's silent. And in Hebrew, you can see that word, but they don't read that word. Then in the third verse, it says, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So here you have an expression or an example of God in the first three verses of Genesis. Well, this is consistent. This is throughout the, the New scripture. Testament. You see it again. The again, word was with it. He was there at the beginning. Of course, in John chapter one, you see, and nothing was made without him. Right. Because in him, it was, was everything. And uh, so we need to understand that Jesus Christ is the expression of fully God, fully man. I don't know how that can happen, but the Holy Spirit does. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. But fully God, fully man. Jesus Christ lived the life that followed the pattern of God that he set back in the law of Moses. He died on the cross for that. And by the way, Jesus was very uh, adamant and very strong with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He called them a brood of vipers. Right. He was very argumentative that way, and he just, I mean, he dressed them down. But we need to understand that Jesus Christ died on the cross for sin. And that gave me the right, the ability to ask the Lord into my heart, because when he rose from the dead, he gives us the gift of eternal life. So we have eternal life if we accept Jesus right. Christ as Lord of our life. Mm -hmm. Lord of our life. And that, that, that's one of the things that, that, that stopped people right there. 
I don't want anybody being Lord of my life. I want to be in control. One is that I want to be in control. The other is, is that we, 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 we look, look at that and we see Jesus. There's a judgment there. There is. There is a, and, I mean, and, and, and people look at the, the Bible. In the New Testament. The people look at the Bible and they say, it, 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 I don't want to be judged. As a matter of fact, you f see a lot of people now that are demonstrating because they feel judged. They're demonstrating against all kinds of things, demonstrating against pro-life because they feel judged for, for their sin. And they don't want to feel judged. You don't have a right to judge me. Why would Christ have a right to judge me? Well, first of all, you know, people react different ways and post-abortion syndrome and all of that. And I would suggest that uh, we not, as Christians, truly who believe, that when somebody comes at us and said, you're judging me, we, we don't need to react to them with anger, but we just need to say, you know what, the Lord, the Lord knows. That's not our, and that really isn't our position. People say that, you know, you, you have no right to judge me. No, I, I don't, because I'm being judged. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Hebrews 9.27 says, it is appointed once for man to die, then face judgment. Judgment seat of Christ, which is about what God has given us, mm -hmm. and the judgment seat of God, which is about salvation. So it's important for us to recognize that Jesus Christ came, died, rose again, and then he, what he did is he spent time with the disciples and he ascended to heaven and the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter two, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit is poured out and the prophets talked about it in Joel and everything else. Sure. Poured out on everyone. Yeah, your sons, your daughters. They're, they're everyone. Prophets. I mean, it wasn't just, you know, the prophets, specific prophets mm -hmm. like Elijah or whatever. It this was everyone. Mm -hmm. And all of the sudden the Holy Spirit is loose and <laughs> comes into people and changes them. And I want to tell you something. Praise God. Yeah, amen. This yeah, is the time of grace we have the Holy Spirit with us. And this is the time we, yeah, we need to, we need to, to embellish that, that, that time. We need to enjoy that time and understand that that's, that's our time right now. It is. And we, the Holy Spirit is working through us at that point. It is, and it's great to be alive in this time, yeah. isn't it? It's awesome. Mm -hmm. And so what happens then is the time, this time comes to an end, and Revelation yeah. is a great, it's a great book. You know, there's controversy in, in the scripture and people are confused about the beginning. Oh, I don't talk about it, and the, but they're confused about the end. Yeah, I don't, I don't talk beginning about and it. the end, they don't talk don't about talk. it. Yet Jesus Christ says, I'm the beginning, yeah. I'm the end. Yeah. Revelation is about Jesus the Filmmakers love Revelation. They, they do. <laughs> they, they, they love the Armageddon. They love, all, they, they love the, you know, <laughs> the apocalypse. They, they love that stuff. But you go along in time and you don't really hear about the church anymore. You go along in time and you begin to read. And then all of a sudden in verse 11, chapter 19, then I saw heaven opened. Now this is heaven. This is mm -hmm. where God is. And there was a white horse and a rider called Faithful and True. Okay, this is interesting. Faithful mm -hmm. and True. That's interesting. And he, is, he's a, he judges and makes war with the justice in his eyes. His eyes were like fiery flames and many crowns were on his head. In other words, he has the authority. Mm -hmm. And he also has the fiery flames in the eyes. That's important. He had a name written on him that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. Okay, so now we have this human element. And then he says, and his name is called the Word of God. That's the Bible. So now you're back to John chapter 1 comparing all this. Then he the says, Word. He says, the armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses. And I hope that I'm part of that army. <laughs> I want to be behind Jesus on that day. But anyway, uh, wearing pure white linen, a sharp sword comes from his mouth so that he might strike the nations, strike the nations, very interesting, with it. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He will also trample the winepress of God's fierce anger and the Almighty, and he has a name no one written on him, or, or written on his side that no one knows except King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now this is Jesus Christ. And to some people that image is very, very scary. It is, but it's the image that the Bible gives us yes. and it's an image that's gonna happen. Yeah, and that's, that's I mean, the, the church is here and they're here today and, and, and there's a, there's, God's given us a mission just like he gave Saul. Absolutely. And we need to be faithful to it. Absolutely. Where do you think right now the, the greatest threat to, to, to the church or Christianity is coming from, inside or outside? Inside, inside. The church is, has got to get the word of God in their heart. They've got to read this it is again. It's powerful. It is and amazing. Have we, have, we, have we left this if people not carrying it to church anymore? Yeah, this is the problem. And they, you know, my, my, this is why we do what we do on our television mm -hmm. program. 
We've seen that the yeah. ratings go down right. for the reading of the Bible, and we've got to get back yeah, into and the you Bible. And the, you and your family do a fabulous job at that. <laughs> Thank you. It, it's, 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 exciting. Yeah. it's exciting to listen to God but through now, His Word. How do, we, how do we get past that then? If the church has got a mission, mm -hmm. and we're making all kinds of excuses like Saul did, the church has got this mission, and, and, and the threat is from the inside. How do we get around that? I mean, we have to overcome all the threats by coming to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has to be the center of our life. We have to make him Lord of our life. We have to say, Lord, I am, ready for this? Be careful because it's going to offend people. I am your slave. Mm -hmm. I'm your bondservant. Just like Paul said, just like James said, just like Jude said, just like they all said, mm -hmm. I'm your bondservant. I will do what you say, not what everybody else yeah. thinks. And that is a personal commitment individually. It's it is. It's not the church. Nope. The church isn't failing or, 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 or being successful it's it's individuals that God's absolutely after. and that church that smallest church is the husband and the wife of course and and as we make the commitment to return to God and read his word as we make the commitment we say we pray and we say Lord I'm gonna read your word I have a tendency to read into it but I want to read out of it I want it to tell me how to live so help me to understand what you're doing here and let me get it and that's so important very important uh, tell, tell me about the, sh the show, though, because th this gets exciting for individuals. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, they, if they'll get back into it, and that's one of the things you're called to, is to get people back into the Word of God, Bible discovery. Uh, I, you, you and the family are doing this. It's an exciting, co it, it's, it's been going on for years, but you guys have, have changed some formats. Our, our, family, our, our family in the program, it was, uh, you know, to be honest with you, I never expected our family to be on the program. But you, you pick out talented people <laughs> and you end up being your son <laughs> and your daughter and your wife. <laughs> they did. They yeah. just, you know, so, I, I don't know. I, they just came. I mean, but uh, we, we have a good time. Yeah. For and those who haven't seen it, where, 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 where can they grab hold of it? Well, at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Mm -hmm. BibleDiscoveryTV. Remember the TV. That's important. Right. BibleDiscoveryTV.com. You can watch it there. And, um, but the idea is that our family has, uh, we, we've taken the dinner conversations that we used to have mm -hmm. about the Bible and about theology. I would sit down and I would start eating and I would, after we pray, I'd say, now, uh, Corey, you know, what do you think if she'd be at school, you know, and come home and I said, so what is, what did, uh, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? And my son would be like, yeah, well, I'm not sure. And then they would get <laughs> into get it. it. And then my, my wife would say, well, I don't think that's right. And then I would just let them go, yeah. let them go. But they discussed the Bible, mm -hmm. and the Bible was talking about human nature, so it was talking about them, but it also talked about God. Right. And so we've done that on the program, right. so that's exciting. And it's leading people to get back into the Word. You're taking them through the Word in a year. Every, every year, year we you're, starting, you're starting thing. fresh and gone right. You, I've gone through the Bible. Old, though, yeah, exactly. It? I've gone through the Bible 30 times, yeah. and, and I, every year I learn more. Oh. And this year's the greatest year because I've learned more wow. this year. Well, so Rod, it's it, it shows. Thank you so much, Thank brother. you so much. Thank you. God bless you. Remember, Viewpoint is made possible entirely by the financial support of viewers just like you. Also remember, you can catch Viewpoint interviews on YouTube and on iTunes and anywhere you can listen to a podcast. I'm Bob Placey. Thanks. Remember, you can share all the Viewpoint interviews you've seen today online at YouTube. And you can listen to the Viewpoint podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and anywhere you can listen to a podcast.